Hello, Desmond. Hey, how are you? I'm fantastic. Well, absolutely huge pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you. Where are you right now? My studio in Laurel Canyon in uh, sunny Los Angeles. That's so Joni Mitchell. <laughs> it is, actually. And where are you? I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, where I live with my husband, Curtis, and we've been together 33 years. Congratulations. We, we have 19-year-old sons, twin sons, Roman and Nero, who are in college in New York. Wow. So we're empty nesting now. So how long have you been in Nashville? Since 95. So you're one of the early birds. I guess, even though in country music, I'm still an outsider, whatever. <laughs> I've been here longer than most of them have been alive. Yes, there was a sort of a huge exodus from Los Angeles, maybe about 15 years ago, I remember it starting and just uh, everybody moving to Las Vegas. What was the other word? Cashville. Yes, I think what happened was that it was very difficult raising children in Los Angeles. And so for those that got married and started having children and they looked at what was going on. And, and it was very expensive also living in Los Angeles. And so because there's been a music community here that's been here since the you know 1930s, it seemed like the, the best place to be um, because it was very centered. So a lot of people that were touring artists uh, found it a kind of a, cent a centered place so they could just jump in any direction around the country. So it, for many reasons, and also over, and there's been a boom in Nashville, uh, just not only in, you know, in country music, but in many genres of music, like the Black Keys are here. I mean, there's so many, uh, Justin Timberlake's here. I mean, Nick Carter's here. Like so many people are here. Well, before it kind of was like Nashville kind of represented like the music of Tennessee. But now when it's like, does Nashville really represent Tennessee anymore? I don't think so, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's so broad. It's so cosmopolitan. I really enjoy living here. We did actually work on a song together in a, in a random way because I was the engineer on The Last Goodbye. Oh, The Last Goodbye, yeah. yeah which you wrote with that, Stephen. That was the last song I wrote with Aerosmith. Stephen's voice was, you know, I mean, it's always fantastic. I mean... I went to see them perform a few years ago at the Music Cares. They were the persons of the year. I never heard Stephen sing Dream On like he sang it that night. I mean, it was just, his voice was spectacular. You know, so he's another one of those, like Mick Jagger. It's like, I call it agelessism. They just, they're just timeless and ageless. And, um, you know, I just adore them. Alice Cooper is like that as well. I personally think one of the beautiful things about your writing is the fact that you've written with all these incredibly huge rock bands, rock stars, but I can tell that you have your roots in like R&B and soul. And I think that's what differentiates you and makes you such the great writer because you bring that element into something which is quite, I don't know, you know, white, as it were. You bring in something that's really got some, you know, girth to it. Well, first of all, I grew up, in, in immersed in Latin music. My mother was the Cuban uh, composer, Elena Casals, and my aunt, Olga Guillot, who was like the most famous singer of Cuba. And my uncle was the showboy, you know, at the Tropicana. So there was always music and poetry going on around me. And because we were very poor uh, in exile, I grew up in the projects uh, of Liberty City. So all the kids, it were, we were all multiracial, and um, it was just so much fun. And out on the swings, uh, we um, would be listening to R&B stations. I don't think there were many. Maybe there was one. <laughs> but, but even at that time, when one uh, listened to the radio, you'd hear the Beatles and then Aretha Franklin. Incredible. Then Dionne Warwick, then Wilson Phillips. Uh, Will uh, Wilson Pickett, Wilson, <laughs> Phillip, Wilson Phillips came later. <laughs> but speaking of Wilson Phillips, the Beach Boys, the Everly Brothers, incredible R&B and pop and Motown and all on the same station. So what happened later when they kind of deregulated radio 
was uh, these multi-channels that are all specific to somebody's specific taste and like. So if you only like music that has no keyboards and only guitars, you can go tune in on that. Or if, uh, if, if it's country music, it's that. If, you know, it's not kind of um, the melting pot, which was America. And I think that in a way, because music is so powerful, I think it's helped to pull people apart. This, this n no access to all kinds of music. And of course, when they cut out music education programs in the schools, then there was even less access to classical music and other kinds of music. Kind of sad in a way how compartmentalized music has become. Urban music is in one category, EDM music is in another, alternative rock or classic rock, traditional American, all this. And so you kind of have to decide what kind of person you are and listen to the music that most identifies with the kind of person you are. But, but that isolates you. So there's less understanding of other kinds of music, of other kinds of people. So I agree I, I 100%. Think that's, I, I think that's like a real um, shame. And, and there's no fixing it. Because the, the marketers are drilling down even further. You know, they'll make music for people that like TikTok. <laughs> or music that only Instagram followers will like, <laughs> you know, and it just goes like that. You're one of the few people that's co-written with Diane Warren, because I know she doesn't like to co-write. She likes to, and you had a hit together as a singer yourself, a Love on a Rooftop. Right, yeah. right. And uh, Paul Stanley's on that song, by the way, as well. Oh, wow. He, it was his title. And ah. um, I have a funny story. It was because... Uh, I usually when I'm co-writing, I'm, I'm, I say, well, let's just come up with a bunch of titles. So me and the other co-writer will be like throwing titles on the table. So I'd be writing down, you know, the ones they were saying, and I'd be writing it down on a list. But, you know, sometimes I, I, I kind of would forget that maybe that wasn't my title. I went to my list and I saw Love on a Rooftop. I said, wow, that's a great title. So me and Diane started writing it. Then I called, you know, Paul so excited. I said, I wrote with Diane Warren. It's called Love on a Rooftop. And, he, and it was like dead silence. It was like, that's my title. It's like, <laughs> oh my God. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, so of course, you know, he be, you know, the, the, we say Love on a Rooftop so many times in the song. He, des he deserves, you know. Like <laughs> way more, you know, credit. <laughs> it sort of makes sense now that you mentioned it. I didn't know that, that, that story, of course, because Love on a Rooftop definitely sounds like a, a Kiss title. <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah. My, my favorite song that I wrote with Paul Stanley, and it was sort of a little bit by accident. He had started a song with Holly Knight called Bite Down Hard, and which was, you know, kind of, I liked it. It was very uh, suggestive. Um, and we started writing it. And so I thought, well, let's write this for Bonnie Tyler because I was going to produce Bonnie Tyler. I said, bite down hard. I don't know if she would sing that. So we changed it to hide your heart and it became the title of her album. And m many other people cut it. Robin Beck, I think Kiss cut it. Hide your heart. I think Ace Freely cut it. Mott the Hoople cut it. <laughs> I, I still haven't heard that version. You know, oh, I'd love to hear but, that. Yeah, but uh, it's just one of my favorite favorite songs. You have your own band. You you had you had some hits on your own. How do you go from that to write to writing? Uh, I was made for loving you, which is one of Kiss's biggest songs. I was in my group Desmond Child and Rouge. We were actually very experimental, combining rock and pop and R and B and punk and Latin music. I mean, we had congas and. Latin horns. I mean, we were doing all the kind of stuff that later on I did with, you know, I worked on with Ricky Martin and Aerosmith and Kiss and stuff later. So Paul Stanley became a fan of Desmond Child and Rouge because he saw our posters all oh, over. Incredible. Town. You know, he liked the look, you know, there I was with this big mullet, you know, blonde mullet, <laughs> but these gorgeous dark haired beauties. And he was very intrigued. So he came to see us at a place called Tracks, 
you know, he came backstage, you know, to say hi before the show and everything. And I was like, I mean, I knew who he was, of course, you know, because of magazines. But I, I thought like Kiss was just for like little kids with lunch boxes and stuff. With, <laughs> you know, I didn't understand the importance of Kiss. I, you know, I mean, they really, you know, changed the course of rock music. You know, they really did. I mean, they combined pop and rock in a way. You know, they took sort of like the stuff that Alice Cooper was doing and they, you know, and combined it with ACDC and Led Zeppelin and, you know, into these hooky, hooky, you know, songs. You know, they've lasted, you know, the test of time for sure. And so he said, hey, uh, why don't we try writing a song together? And I said, oh, really? And, you know, for your band? Well, maybe. And I said, uh, well, you, then you have to write for my band. You know, I mean, I don't know why, you know, I was so daring to say such a thing. <laughs> but we did write a song called The Fight, which we co-wrote with David Landau, uh, John Landau's brother. That song, you know, made it onto our first Desmond Chalon Rouge album. And then the, the other song that we wrote, uh, he invited me to come and write with him. This is part of the, the deal, the bargain, right? So I came to SIR uh, where they were rehearsing. And during the break, uh, you know, the band all like kind of brushed past me, like, you know, nobody said hi, just kiss, uh, you know, was just like on their break. And uh, Paul invited me to come on the stage and we pulled the big heavy canvas cover off of a piano and we sat in the corner and I sat and I, we started writing, I was made for loving you. I think that I got the better part of that bargain because <laughs> actually you know it's i was made for loving you has become kiss's biggest international song in history absolutely growing up in in the uk we, we weren't really that familiar with kiss but we were certainly familiar with that song it's a huge song some people criticized it because it had a dance beat so it seemed to get away but you know and people were saying oh it's kiss has gone disco but not really you listen to it, it's more like the far, four tops, like standing in the shadow of love. Da, 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 da. You know, kind of like, and with the kind of the, the, the Motown stomp, because Paul is a huge fan of Motown and R&B. And, you know, he has like even a new record that, you know, like soul record, like he, he just loves it. And so it really was a dance beat. We weren't at at all having disco in our minds. But also there was another innovation that happened at the time, which was drum machines. And so I had gotten one of the first prototypes and it was this tiny little thing and it just went boom, tsh, boom. Tsh. And so <laughs> you can make it go faster and slower. And so I started writing songs to like a four on the floor beats. And so that was sort of an influence on, on that as well. And you know, the song is infectious and, and haunting. And, um, you know, every time that chorus comes in, you can't help but jump up, you know, just makes me so happy. It's like, it has to be like the number one karaoke song of all time. It, it's a development in Kiss's career as well, bringing in all of these other elements. And, you know, as I was pointing out, it, it enabled them to, as you were saying, have an international hit. And sort of, especially at a time in 1979 where like Europe was sort of moving towards post-punk and new wave and that classic rock stuff was maybe getting a little left behind and bang, this comes out and we all know who they are. And I think that it influenced, that one particular song influenced everything that came after, including, yep. you know, you know, Madonna and Kiss and George Michael and everything. It's like rock guitars with a dance beat. Yep. It was an innovation. It was like an, a turn. It was like, oh, guitars can be on dance music? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and every, everybody started doing it in their own way. You do the song with Paul. It becomes a Kiss single. It's absolutely massive. I mean, the, then the world just must be opening up. What was the next step? Was the phone was ringing off the hook? Did, did, you, have, did you even have a manager in those days or even a publisher? I, I did have a manager. And I didn't have a publisher because Kiss published me for that particular song. And so, you know, they were always very fair and very good, good to me. And, 
helped me and gave me advances and kept me going. And so for that, I'm very, very grateful to them. I was in my group, Desmond Child and Rouge, and we had a very wild year in 1979 because we put out two albums. We toured the country. Uh, the girls I sang with in Rouge, they were um, in on Broadway with Gilda Radner in her show called uh, Gilda Live from New York, which was also a movie uh, that was filmed, a documentary called Gilda Live. And then we, because of our relationship with Gilda, she invited us to be the musical guests of Saturday Night Live. So in one year, we came from out of nowhere. Wow. And we were, you know, on Saturday Night Live. But you see, there was one kind of little thing about it is that that year, and I was just turning 23, 24, that year, um, I realized that I was more gay than I was bi. <laughs> and Maria, <laughs> Maria Vidal, who was my girlfriend, who we built the group together, it, it became impossible to stay together. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that was, um, that's kind of what broke Desmond, Desmond Child and Rouge and the album, that, the second album we made, we went from all colorful and fun and blue eyed soul to kind of a post punk rock pop thing, very minimalistic G.E. Smith on guitars, you know, and um, the opening song is called The Truth Comes Out. And it really was my, my coming out song. And so, you know, it was pretty early in, in everything for, for, for me to do that. But I, I had to be myself. And, um, you know, I immediately started to feel like a chill around me because of it. So I tried, uh, you know, to start up my own band called Yankee. And then I didn't really know what I was doing uh, because I, I always felt better when I was writing for Desmond Child Rouge because it was a concept. You know, it was, even though it's my name, we were, we were writing for like this thing that this thing that was outside of myself. That's why I think I've been successful working with artists um, other than for myself, because you know, when I'm working for the team, when I'm working for this dream, for this image, for this icon, for this, this whole thing, I can throw myself into it. When I was started writing songs, just me, I was like, what do I write about? You know, there's a new artist out now who I just absolutely adore. And his name is Jake Wesley Rogers. And he has a song out now called Pluto. And he's so stunning. And it's like, if I had only been free to be myself like he is, maybe the, the story of my life would have been different, you know? But then again, I wouldn't have written all those songs because I would have been hoarding whatever bits of whatever imagination I had just for myself. And um, because of the fact that I work with so many artists and they went on and they toured and they promoted those songs. I've sold over 500 million records and none of those artists individually have sold that, that what I've sold. So it's because of that. I really do miss the idea of being a rock star myself, you know, and maybe because I still have that hunger inside, I can, I can help other people achieve that like vicariously. Uh, but I still do perform. I started performing right before COVID. I performed at 54 Below and I made a live album that's on BMG called Desmond Child Live. And it's a small kind of cabaret show. And Desmond Child and Rouge has a, you know, a reunion on the record. And then I performed at the Great American Songbook Series at Lincoln Center. And I'm getting ready to do a show in Greece, in Athens. I'm not, sh I'm not sure where Beautiful. or when, but uh, it's all in the planning stages. I'm hoping it happens this June. And um, all the diff different artists that I've worked with are going to you know, join me on stage. And you know, we're going to sing together. And it's going to have an orchestra and a band. And um, I think maybe, you know, late, I could have a late life kind of Vegas act, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I do love singing and I still can sing. So 
that's because I didn't ruin my voice being on the road for 35 years. <laughs> I saved the, like, saved the best for last. <laughs> <laughs> You're a great piano player as well, because that's you playing piano on another last goodbye. I'm not a great piano player. We well, sounded good on that. <laughs> I, I can plunk away in a certain way, and I, I play piano usually in the writing sessions, but most of the time, you know, I get shoved aside and, uh, <laughs> you know, the band takes over the, the songwriting of the music part, and I'm really strong on concepts and lyrics. So basically, I can do it all, but, you know, it's really, if you don't have a great title, if you don't have a great reason to open your mouth to sing, to say something, you have nothing. And that's what people don't un understand. Almost anybody can write a song. Birds are singing right now, but they can't say words. So, you know, we have it over them. But the fact <laughs> is that they're making music all day long. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. Your writing process, if you, you're working with somebody that you've never worked with before, for instance, is there a period of time of getting to know somebody, trying to get inside of their head? figure out something that they, they might want to say? Or is it just everything's different? Each person has a different experience. In general, it's like when they come to me, right away, it's like the walls go down. And they're just so anxious to talk to somebody that has empathy. So that's my key gift is I have empathy. I can feel what they're feeling and they start telling me their stories and pretty soon they're crying and pretty soon something they're saying becomes the title and we build everything on that and they're actually putting their lives into the music. I'm helping them, I am assisting them, I'm guiding them into being the truth, not thinking about what could be the next big hit. You know, I just never could think about that. It's like thinking about riding a bicycle, you just fall off. You know, if you start thinking about it too much, you just go, you know, in, inside, a, inside a song, when you're in the sacred space working with somebody, it's instant intimacy. I guess it's the world's second oldest profession, songwriting. Some would argue they go hand in hand, the first and second. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, because... You know, to be able to write a song together, you have to have intimacy. I remember once after uh, I finished writing with uh, Joe Perry and Steven Tyler, we had just finished the demo of What It Takes. It was really sounding almost like exactly like how the record turned out. And Steven turned to me and he looked at me with like, you know, kind of very kind face and soft eyes. And he says, now we get to live together forever in our song. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. And that's just one of the most beautiful things I've heard. But if you think about it, the pact that we make when we write a song is a forever pact. It lasts longer than the marriages. <laughs> it's not, it lasts longer than your own life. And it goes beyond even your children's lives. It, it goes on forever and ever and ever. Because that song, even if it goes into public domain, it will still have your name on it next to your co-writers. It's forever. I mean, isn't that fantastic? That's absolutely beautiful. Isn't that one of the fewest things in the entire world that's forever? If you don't mind going back, chronologically, Billy Squire jumps up next. As Kiss were publishing you, were they also creating, you know, in those early days, creating opportunities for you? Were they... Uh saying, hey, you should write with this guy or that guy, or, or were you getting it yourself? Well, Billy Squire was with a coin management, right? I think that's how I got a chance to work with him. But I have to say, you know, I, you know, I haven't seen him in, you know, decades. But those writing sessions to me were very difficult. I don't know if he really wanted to be there with me. I think he was suspicious of my credibility. He was very kind of cold and kind of noncommittal and uh, didn't seem excited to be with me. I mean, I know we wrote, you know, You Should Be High Love. I, I know we wrote some songs, 
Um, he lived very nearby. And um, I once went to his beautiful apartment. It was on like a low floor of like El Dorado or like one of those gorgeous Central Park West apartments. And you could look right into the Central Park. And I was like, his taste was incredible. His apartment, the artwork, everything about it. I mean, because when we did write, I don't think it, it was there. It was like in some, you know, rehearsal room or something like that. When I went to his house, you know, I saw that he was a very artistic person. I never got a chance to meet up with him again. But, you know, it's like one of the, you know, that's one of the few experiences I've had where I didn't feel like I could connect with that person, like, you know, like, like shake them up and like, hey, you're here with me. You know, it was very kind of dreamy and, and weird. I'm glad that we wrote together, you know, because we did have a hit. But I think it's important, you know, I mean, I can really get along with everybody and anybody. I mean, one of the reasons I, I, I think I was successful with bands was because I wasn't a threat to them, you know, like if they went off to their AA meeting, I would still be, you know, with the wife, she'd be making dinner and talking. And then by the time they get, they got back, I'd have rearranged the furniture and rehung paintings and fluffed the pillows. And, you know, <laughs> so it wasn't like I was ever going to be somebody that would, you know, run off with their wives. You know, <laughs> So I was like the, the palace eunuch. Like I was very, <laughs> I was very safe. I was very safe. And then, of course, the wives would say, oh, you should invite Desmond to come back and maybe he can help me redecorate the, <laughs> the den. You know? So I kept getting re reinvited back to write, but maybe it was like for, for ulterior motives. <laughs> While you were talking about the Billy Squire experience, I would imagine, without putting words into your mouth, that actually it was probably a good experience to learn, okay, harden you know, your resolve to get in there and get inside people and, and really help them bring something out. It's almost like a negative experience like that, you know, actually enforces the positive of what you, what you, what you can bring to a session. I, I really haven't had that many sessions that have been weird. I mean, I'm, I think I've always been myself. So some people respond well to it and some people not so much. Uh, but, you know, in the most part, people are willing to trust me and uh, put their, their stories and their souls and their passions and their fears into my hands. So chronologically, at least uh, to my notes, is, uh, is, is Cher. Um, I'm sure you were doing other things between Billy and Cher, but... Uh... Well, when I was a little kid, when I was like 12 years old, I was a huge fan of Sonny and Cher and especially Cher, and I had a big post of her in my room, and I would like, I couldn't decide whether I wanted to sleep with her or be her. <laughs> and so I, I finally got, um, David Wolfert recorded a, a couple of songs with her on, a, on an album. I think one was called The Book of Love, or Walk With Me, um, some songs that I had written for her, but I never had met her. And uh, eventually, she was on Broadway in a, in a Broadway show called Welcome to the Five and Dime, Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean. And um, she had also been making movies at the time that still hadn't come out, Moonstruck, Mask. John Claudner, who I was, you know, working with, with Aerosmith, asked me to, to work with her, to meet her. And um, so <laughs> it was... It was just so exciting. I, I went to see the show, and then uh, the next day, uh, I think it was her day off, it was a Monday or something, I um, went to this beautiful suite that they had given her, and I walk in, and it was like meeting Cleopatra. She was just like on this <laughs> like divan with the black bangs like this and the eyeliner, and she was just like, you know, the, it smelled so incredible in there you know, incense and perfumes. And I really <laughs> felt like I walked into Cleopatra's, you know, tent, right? And uh, she was very nice and 
And so that's, that's, that's where we started. And so I got the opportunity to produce songs for her. I had a song that I had written with John Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora during the New Jersey record, I think it was, that we were writing songs for it called We All Sleep Alone. And John didn't think it was really a male lyric. And it works so well with her, you know, because, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's so kind of, you know, just like, ah, it's so deep, you know, when she sings sooner or later, we all sleep alone. It's like, that's true. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> no one escapes that <laughs> kind of aloneness, you right. And, um, you know, so then I co-wrote a song with Diane Warren called Just Like Jesse James. She cut that and she cut Love on a Rooftop. She, right, she, she cut Love on a Rooftop, right? Because yes. I, wanted to, I wanted to hear her sing those woes. Whoa, 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 you know, it's just like, who wouldn't want to hear that like over and over again? Diane at the same time was, had a production partner, Guy Roche, and they had produced a song called uh, Turn Back Time. I don't know if I introduced Diane to, to share, but I told her to come to the studio and um, play the song for her. And Cher was a little bit iffy about it. And Diane taught me a lot. She got on her hands and knees in front of her and begged her to cut the song. Wow. Like she, she literally got on her hands and knees, half joking, but more not joking <laughs> than, than, it, than that. And it's, Diane showed me, it's like, hey, you want something? Get on your hands and knees and beg for it, if that's what you have to do. And right. that that song was the savior of the record, because it helped se sell all the other songs that were on the record, including mine. So I helped out with the background vocals. It was me, Robin Beck, and Maria Vidal. We sang the background vocals. You know, you know, incredible. Uh, Turn back time, find a way. You know, it was like, it was so much fun. And I think that uh, Diane and Guy Roche uh, did an extraordinary job making that hit record. And it was, great, it was great for Diane because it ha gave her the credibility of being a producer in her own right. Good, she good, does, good. She doesn't have that much patience to do that in general, but I thought it was a great, great, really great thing. And she and I are such close friends. And uh, she really came through. And so um, then there was another record, you know, and um, then I think I got a couple of songs on that record too. Um, I think we wrote Perfection. I'm not, I, I'm getting the two albums con confused. I did have a, a kind of argument with Cher in the studio because I had, um, I, I put a guitar solo uh, on the song Main Man that was on Desmond Child and Rouge's record. It wasn't a great time for me because I was also in this kind of commune cult where it was all about the truth. You know, you had to always tell the truth, you know, no matter what, because in the end it would all come out okay. But I think I was too hard on that. And so she was in the studio and uh, the solo came up. I think Steve Lukather played it and she was like, I don't like that. I said, let's step outside. I said, you can't just say you don't like something. You have to say why you don't like it. I mean, no one ever talked to her like that. And I don't think I should have. I think it was the <laughs> I mean, you don't treat Cleopatra that way, you know? And so I think that I pissed her off. And so um, I think little by little, she chose not to work with me. Maybe I was just too strong-willed. Um, but she was always been nice. She invited me to her birthday party. And we have a mutual friend, Joanna Stoutinger, and they kind of grew up together. And so she, uh, Joanna says, oh, Cher says to send, send uh, you her love, but to keep most of it for me. <laughs> <laughs> Which I love. And, um, you know, so... I'm hoping that she'll um, let me interview her for my documentary. When does that come out? Well, I don't know. It could be years, but we're starting to collect the interviews. Oh, fantastic. 
while people still look really good, <laughs> <laughs> including me. <laughs> no, I mean, you have to start putting interviews in the can. And so, um, you know, we're starting. And so this year, so bit by bit, and then eventually maybe I'll get a deal and I'll get the money to, to finish it. Because, you know, any documentary is a million dollars to make. That's no joke because you also have to license the songs, even if they're your own, because you have co-writers and their publishers are not giving the songs away for nothing. We made a, a documentary uh, that was released in 2013, my husband and I, about wanting to have children and, and finding our surrogate mother and our egg donor and, you know, putting it all together. It's called To the Story of Roman and Nero. And you can go on to the documentary.com and see the little trailer. And it's, it's not a long movie, and it's very, very sweet. And our, our boys, who were nine at the time, um, narrate the movie. Oh, beautiful. But I mean, even with that, like we sell, we paid for it all ourselves and all that. It was so expensive. But I had to, <laughs> I had to license my own songs to go in our documentary that wasn't even going to make any money. But that's the way it is. You know, writers shouldn't have to give away their music for free for free. And I understand that. And I respect that. So more work with Kiss, uh, Heaven's on Fire. Paul hadn't come back to work with me after I was made for loving you. Uh, Gene hated the song. I was made for loving you. <laughs> and, you know, during that period of time, they decided to take their makeup off so that they could maybe join the ranks of, you know, normal bands like Aerosmith and Bon, you know, bon Jovi and all that Rolling Stones that perform in their own faces and you know they were handsome men and there was you know all that so they tried it out and well we had heavens on fire i think on animalized then they made a record called the elder uh with bob ezrin who's one of my dear friends but gene kept going around uh doing interviews and saying we we're writing everything ourselves we don't need co-writers in fact we're putting guards in front of the studio doors to keep Desmond Child out. <laughs> he didn't say it just one time. He said it like dozens of interviews all <laughs> around the world, like hundreds of interviews. And I and it, st it started getting, you know, I started hearing reports of it and it, like, it really hurt my feelings. It's like, you know, and I called Paul and I said, why did he do that? If he's going to insult somebody, why doesn't, he, why doesn't he insult an enemy? not somebody who's actually put money in his pocket, you know? And he said, well, you know, Gene is Gene, you know, I can't control what he says and all this. And the next day I come home and on the, and on my voicemail, you know, the little recording in those days, I press play and it goes, hi, it's Gene. Sorry. Click. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably the only apologies ever like given anyone yeah. Anytime ever. And it was yep. one word. Sorry. Boom. <laughs> but it, it, ever, ever since then, we've been very close and he's advised me, you know, I've come to him for counsel, you know, and for help. And uh, he's, uh, you know, referred me to a fantastic attorney, Bob Lang. And just, you know, he's been very supportive of me and always calls me very handsome and attractive. So I like that. This is fantastic. Bonnie Tyler is, um, I'm a huge fan. What, a, what an incredible voice Bonnie Tyler has. And you've, you've done a lot of stuff with her over the years. She actually was making Faster Than the Speed of Night, I think it was. That's very Jim, Jim Steinman. You know, it's the, always the opposites, you know. Like, yeah. Um, and so he had heard a song of mine called Lovers Again. And um, it was just a piano vocal demo. And he, and he decided to cut it on her on that record. He called me out of the blue. I ne had never met him. In fact, I never met him. I only met him like one time ever. And that was at the Songwriters Hall of Fame. But yet we had a lot to do with each other, you know, in other ways through Meatloaf and, and Bonnie and everything. And so he, he asked me to write a song. He said, write me a song that has the verse like Tina Turner, the B section like the police, and the chorus likes Bruce Springsteen. Can you do that? I said, yes, I can. I spent the whole weekend, this was in June of 1983, and I spent the whole weekend coming up with a song 
And oh, one more thing. It has to it has to have something to do with androgyny. That's all he said. So I, I you know, I'm really good when I'm told what to do. And so I I wrote this song. So I solely wrote this song called If You Were a Woman and I Was a Man. And so the verses go, the Tina Turner part was, how's it feel to be a woman? How's it feel to be a man? Are we really that different? Tell me where we stand. Then comes the B section. I look at you, the police section. I look at you. You look away. Why do you say we're night and day? Da, 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 one more day. And then it goes into the chorus. If you were a woman and I was a man, would it be so hard to understand that our hearts are hot and we do what we can? If you were a woman and I was a man. If you were a woman and I was a man. She cut it. It was a big hit in Europe. And I think it went all the way to the top in certain territories like France. Nobody did anything with that here in the United States. And so two years went by and I was kind of disappointed because I said, I knew that's a hit. That's a hit chorus. So by the way, this is a tale of three hits. So then my very first day that I met Bon Jovi, I had um, a title in my back pocket. And so it, you give love a bad name. And then that's when John looked up at me and he all of a sudden I saw the billion dollar smile, right? You know, it was like all those teeth, man. It was like, wow, <laughs> you know. And, you know, he had a song that he had written before called Shot Through the Heart. So he threw that in, you know, and I said, okay, Shot Through the Heart, and you're to blame, darling, you give love a bad name, which is my title. And so that was our first, you know, triple high five with, uh, with Richie Sambora. And so then I said, look, I have this song that I wrote for Bonnie Tyler. I solely wrote it, but I really think that the chorus is a hit song. The Bonnie Tyler song kind of had that same... And it was like a little bit like Billie Jean or the Eurythmics, like uh, these dreams are made of this, you know, do, 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 right? And so I said, Richie, uh, you know, play this. And I went, do, 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 He said, no, man, that's like Michael Jackson, man. Like we're a rock band. I said, play it on the guitar and chug it like, like, chung, 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 chung. Second big smile from John Bon Jovi. Then the chorus, you know, that was, if you were a woman, I was, they became shot through the heart and you're to blame, darling, you give love a bad name. Cut to present day, Ava Max and her team of nine writers um, came up with a song called Kings and Queens. So then they came to me and they asked for an interpolation license for if you were, uh, for uh, you give love a bad name. I said, no, no, actually, because they thought they were different enough. I said, no, you've got to listen to the original song. If you're a woman, as I was a man, it's like, you know, if kings could put queens up on a throne, you would pop champagne and make a toast. And it had to do with androgyny, kings and queens. You were one of them. And I don't know if they'd ever heard the original, but that melody pulled them back to the original. So then that's the song that was interpolated in Kings and Queens. And it actually, and my name is on the song as a co-writer. It's my sixth decade of number one hits. Wow. Six decade. Count it. 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, 2010, 2020. Six. Hello. That's a lot of, that's a lot of decades. <laughs> so, so I'm good till 2030. Then I need to have another number one to be seven. Seven, seven is a lucky number. I have to have seven decades of number one records. What do you think? I think you can do it. I think if anybody can do it, you can do it. So, I mean, that was great. You, you, you led into to, to, to Bon Jovi uh, really beautifully. To me, you're sort of synonymous with, with some of the biggest hits, definitely of all time. And the the way you're able to like take a chorus and just the lift like 
when I when I think of like that period there, I mean the key change, the way it could just change key, bang, chorus could just jump out of nowhere. The first time you heard that song, it wasn't like one of those songs that you had to hear 50 times on the radio and you're like, oh, wow, I really love this song. I remember the first time I heard that song. I remember specifically the first time I heard that song and it was like, wow, this is a hit song. I don't know many songs that do that, that just like smash you over the head with a cricket bat or sorry, baseball bat, and just say hit. I suppose, you know, from a sort of technical perspective, what, did you get into the idea of like doing this kind of juxtaposition? You were talking earlier about Jim Steinman who had come to you with different, you know, wanting different sections to sound in a certain way. You know, was there anything conscious about that? Because I'd love to know a little bit of the technical as well. You know, with, with uh, You Give Love a Bad Name, it just explodes when that chorus comes in. I don't know if there's ever been anything before or since like that. You know, it just was one of those songs. We wrote it in an hour and a half, and it just <laughs> all came together. But, you know, when you have a, a, a strong title, you know, and I love titles that have irony, you know, You Give Love a Bad Name. I hate myself for loving you. Heaven's on fire. You know, how can we be lovers if we can't be friends? You know, right. it's like that when you have the title, the song can fly. So as far as, you know, modulations and all of that, like the one that's the most intricate and I can't even figure it out and I don't even know how I came up with it is Poison by Alice Cooper. Oh, I mean, wow. Yeah. It, it modulates up, it modulates down in the middle of things. I mean, it's just like it was inspired. And I'll never forget writing that song in a little hotel room in Charlottesville, Virginia with Alice Cooper. We had just gone to the cafeteria down the street and with a little tray and Alice Cooper and everyone's like, he's here, you know, at the yeah. cafeteria. And we went up to the room and, you know, we were writing a, an album called Trash and I was, you know, s signed as the producer of it. Alice explained, you know, that, you know, his music is very theatrical and Alice Cooper doesn't exist. His name is Vincent Fournier. Alice Cooper was the name of his band and then people started calling him Alice. So now, you know, he's Alice Cooper. But the fact that he had that objectivity to say we're writing for a character, you know, right? So in that particular case, you know, and also, you know, like with Bon Jovi as well, or whoever I'm writing with, it's like the song itself calls for what it needs to be. So, right. you know, I'm not saying, hey, let's throw our modulation in here and that'll be the sure. hit. You know, yeah, I don't, yeah. I, I could never think that way. It just, you know, doesn't work like that for me. You know, like at the end of Living Out a Prayer, uh, there was, um, was you, you live for the fight and it's all that you got. There was a big drum so fill there. <laughs> oh, and then it went into the, and when I heard the demo, I said, hey guys, that, that drum fill sounds kind of corny, man. Let's just edit it. Let's just go, the, 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 all that you got. And it's a bar of three and it goes, oh, right into the chorus that modulates. So you didn't get that feeling of like, I write the songs that make the, <laughs> I write the songs that make, you know, it, it wasn't like that, you know, because yeah. uh, those, those modulations are usually telegraphed somehow ahead of the, ahead of time. I love just like slamming down on a modulation because it seems like that's what's called for, not for any other reason, because, uh, you know, it's sort of like just, it's, can be stunning. And sometimes, it, most of the time, it's a whole step modulation. I think in that case, it was like a minor third modulation. I don't know. It just like, I mean, it was barely singable, you know, in, <laughs> uh, in Living on a Prayer. And John, John forever, like, you know, throws me a, you know, uh, a middle finger salute. I can't believe we wrote this. It's so high, you know. <laughs> but the, the thing is, is that I don't have a formula, you know, I go in cold, usually with no idea, a blank page and, uh, you know, or a blank screen these days. <laughs> I think it's better to, you know, at write on pages because at least you have something you can sell on eBay later. 
So really, there's the, the there's no machinations. Really, right. I'm I'm all about feeling and story. And so you every vertical moment of a song matters, even if it's a silence. So how those vertical moments are strung together into a narrative that feels satisfying, that feels unsatisfying, because when you get to the end, it makes you want to hear the song again. Right. It has to be slightly unsatisfying because then yeah. you got to hear it again, you know, and hear it again and hear it again. It's yep. repeated listening that makes a hit. I mean, yes, I do agree. Repeated listening does make a hit, but there is something about those uh, Bon Jovi songs that were just, they're one of the few songs that just says hit song from the minute I, th I first heard it. And not only that, they don't get old. Only we do. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, it's that when you write a song properly, it stands the test of time. Right. You know, and a lot of my songs have become coined phrases in language, like live in la vida loca. Yep. You yep. know, there's so many times I see my title reinterpreted, you know, like if a hotel has villas, live in las villas loca. You know, it's like you, I, you, I see it always um, reinterpreted so many times. Now, Aerosmith, of course, they must have looked and went, hmm. So we got Desmond Child and Bruce Fairburn. I think we should get those two, you know, or was it John? Was it John Kolodner? No, what it, was the, it, was, it was John Kolodner, um, you know, doing his, his Merlin, you know, <laughs> magic. They did not want to write with me. Oh, well. You know, they had never written with an outside writer. They didn't care, you know, really about what was happening in radio because, you know, they're like, Aerosmith is like, you know, the Rolling Stones. Has the Rolling Stones, have the Rolling Stones ever changed their style in 50, 60 years? No. It's still good. It's still good. And it's all good. Always good. Aerosmith is a band like that. They're classic. So I think that one of the chief ways that I help that in the, in, in the songs that I wrote with them is that when it's just the two of them, it's not always a flow, you know? And so I think when I was in the room, you know, because it's a, the rivalry between the lead guitar player and the singer is famous, and that's what makes chemistry. But sometimes you, one can come to an impasse creatively. So, you know, I was like thrown into the den of the, you know, the, uh, there was a, a tiger and a lion, right? And all I had was a pad, <laughs> a pad, a paper and a pen. And I think it was like, because I was there, they were on best behavior with each other and they didn't want to seem in discord. And I think that, you know, I was able to, to you know, if, if I thought one person had a really great idea, I'd support them and then be fair and support the other one. So then somehow we would cobble together, you know, the music, um, in a, and, and I did add, you know, a lot, you know, but I think that my biggest contribution is, is, was helping them get excited about music again. And then they, of course, wrote great songs without me and with other co-writers. Absolutely. But, uh, I mean, dude looks like a lady is, it's pretty synonymous with with Aerosmith, you know, I'm, I'm good friends with Jack Douglas and I and obviously work with him on uh, music from another dimension, but we're not stupid. You know, we know toys and rocks, pump and permanent vacation are the highlight of Aerosmith's career. You know, not just in success, but in artistry as well. If it's Kolodner that, that had the, the wherewithal to do this, then he's a, he's a smart man because, you know, those records are phenomenal. John Kladner is a brilliant man, and he has the most exquisite taste of all the A and R people, you know, I've ever worked with. You know, you know, right there you know, with Clive Davis. You know, like these guys really can hear songs. They really n knew what they were talking about. Another person who's like that is Jay Landers, who is uh, Barbara Streisand's musical supervisor for thirty two albums or maybe more. And um, I, you know, and I started working with Barbara 
like three years ago, and I wrote a song for her uh, called Lady Liberty for her album Walls. And I got a chance to co-produce that song with her. I've heard that in the past, she's very hard on producers. She wasn't with me. She also, I've been known to like write 20 pages of notes. She, she didn't. She liked the song the way it was and she sang it and she did an extraordinary job. And so I, hopefully I'll be working with her on her next record. Uh, so I've been, I, all summer I've been writing new songs for her, you know, to present to her. You know, and um, hopefully some of them are built to be duets with some of the biggest icons. So I have to kind of do demos that have somebody that sounds a little bit like the duet partner that we're suggesting. And it's really fun. It's, it's, it's very exciting to have that challenge. And working with um, a man like Jay Landers, who's, you know, his understanding of music is so profound. You know, it's, he's a mentor to me. He's a teacher. And I think that's one of the things that's important through life is you're never too old to be a student and to start, you know, learning a whole other genre of music. I mean, one of the things I told Barbara when I first uh, met her, I said, you know, you've created a genre of music all your own. And then I paused for a second and said, the only problem is that you're the only one in the genre. <laughs> she liked that very much <laughs> she had a good laugh with that <laughs> so i won her over <laughs> you're working with jimmy barnes john Waite, some more kiss jennifer rush um it's it, you're busy you're a busy man I, it looks like you know in 87 ata i mean you're i mean how did you balance it all when you're just you must be the first call for pretty much everybody at that point. Not really. I, mean, <laughs> I you think know, you're being modest. I remember listening to some or reading some interview of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and they said, well, we would never write with Desmond Child. You know, it's like, <laughs> okay, then I won't write with you then. You know, <laughs> you know I don't know. I mean, they're great too, but may, they didn't need me. But – um the the thing is, is that I'm also quick. You know, I capture the idea and I'm able to quickly get things to happen. So it's not like I'm working on a song for, you know, decades and playing one string at a time to make a chord. You know, like there are producers that are very meticulous uh, and and all of that and their records are fantastic. But I'm much more of a spontaneous um, creator. I was lucky enough to have a manager, you know, Winston Simone, who helped me to navigate, you know, through which ones to do, which ones not to do, which ones I was most suited for, or at least even if I wasn't most suited for, that would be the most challenging, you know, would be a worthwhile experience. That makes perfect sense. I was going to ask that. Where, is there a, is that a huge part of the process? I mean, having team members, obviously, that have great taste, have a business understanding as well, because I would imagine a big part of this, I mean, you're, you're obviously a relationships guy. You understand how to get inside an artist and bring out the best. I mean, you've been proven time and time again with your success. But you're obviously not the person talking to the A&R guy or the manager of the band. I mean, I would imagine having a... I, I, I have I have also, you know. Absolutely. Like Rick, after we had the big hit with Ricky Martin, the Cup of Life, which was the 1998 World Cup theme, I mean, it was number one instantly all over the world. He performed that song on the Grammys, and that's when everyone discovered Ricky Martin. Well, the next day I got a call from the manager, Angel Medina, he said, oh, you have to write us a song in Spanglish, a Spanglish song. <laughs> and it was like, okay. So Draco and I, uh, Draco Rosa and I got together and we wrote a song in Spanglish. Uh, but it really wasn't Spanglish. It was uh, just had a three Spanish words, live in la vida loca. So live in was English, la be that loca. That's the only Spanish there is in that song. So when I delivered the song to the label, the head of the label said, that's really great. Now, can you do an English version? I said, it is in English. What? 
no one's going to understand what is the La Vida, what? I said, hey, man, people, you know, go to Pollo Loco. You know, they know the <laughs> word loca, loco. You yeah. know, I'm driving me loco, you know, vida. Yeah. It's like la dolce vida. Every, it's like they're not complicated words. Everybody knows those words. You know, anyone who took Spanish in school. Oh, uh, okay. So the big ad in Billboard comes out and it said, live in la vida loca. And then underneath, like in bigger letters said, live in the crazy life. <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? You know? <laughs> And so, yeah, you know, sometimes I, I, and those were like calls that, you know, I had to field myself, yeah. you know, oh, it I wasn't, yeah. you know, <laughs> I guess if we had come up with Despacito at that time, which is almost all Spanish, yeah, that, that wouldn't have flown. So it took 20 years between Vida Loca and Despacito to bookend, you know, the Latin music explosion. Despacito, which was almost all in Spanish, yep. uh, I mean, was number one for 37 weeks. Incredible. It's one of the biggest songs in the world, and everybody understood it fine. It's funny, because I was going to sort of roll up to that, because I feel like that Ricky Martin, that song, it really did open the floodgates in, in, in such a wonderful way. I, I mean, now if you go to Spotify and listen to, like, the top 40, there's accents, there's languages, things that we never had, you know, how it was always used right. to be oh, you know, you have to sing uh, in English with an American accent. Even the British bands would sing with American accents, you know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and, we, you know, it's because we wanted to be. We, we all grew up wanting to be like Motown and blues stars, you know, I mean, that, that and Stax. I mean, that was the... That's why I love Imogen Heap, because she sings like in this posh, you yeah. know, S Sloan Street, you know, kind of like accent, you know, Sloan Ranger accent. I love, you know... So you're super busy. I've got to ask you on a personal level, was it easy to cope with or was it just a case of doing what's in front of you? Something else comes up, you go in. Where, you know, because not many people have that kind of level of success compacted like that. I mean, a lot of people, you know, we're talking about earlier, personally, a lot of demons come up there. They find it really hard to handle that level of success. Um, how did you maintain a level head through that? Really, I have to credit my husband, uh, Curtis. I mean, he is like the most level-headed person, and he's like the fairest person. He is absolutely not impressed with anything that's showbiz. He's, you know, like the rock of our lives. And so I'm very, very lucky that I found my true love and that we, um, you know, have such a beautiful relationship. And so he keeps my head on straight. I mean, he really does. It's just, why are you so, so up, upset about that? Like, just let it go. Um, let it go. You know, just see what happens. And, you know, that's a big part of it. That's and beautiful. because I grew up very poor, it's like uh, there's a kind of like, uh, maybe it's not humility, but it's like, keep your head down, keep working. You know, just keep working. Just go to the next and keep working. And, you know, there's so much joy in the actual songwriting process. That's really the most fantastic, miraculous, beautiful part of my life. The, the trouble starts once the song is finished. <laughs> then it's like, who's going to demo it? I mean... I'm working on a song to present to Barbara Streisand, and I've had five different uh, singers sing sing the, her part. It's a, one oh, of wow. the duet songs. It's not even mm -hmm. the entire song. It's like one of the duet songs. Right. And finally, 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 I found someone that in, encapsulated the the womanliness and the class and the you know and the still and the hipness all in one, but it took me five tries. I just don't let go until it's perfect because someone like Barbara can, can only and should only listen to something one time through. It's either in or it's out. So any changes you want to make, you can't say, well, if I only had done this. No, it's got to come to her as perfection to the best of your ability. And, uh, you know, I, 
you know, I first saw her singing in the movie Funny Girl when I was 15 years old. So that was like 1968. I mean, that's when I knew I was gay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I told her, I said, you turned me gay. And she says, a lot of people say I did that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and um, the, the thing is that her, her, her passion and you know, her commitment and her, the excellence, you know, is so inspiring. Like everything she touches, she's so unique. She's a, she's a global treasure. I mean, I'm going to submit her for the heritage, you know, thing, you know, it's like, <laughs> she should be like a heritage site, like herself. Like she is just so special. It's kind of one of those things where it's like, I know how privileged I am to even have access to her. I, I pitched her songs through Jay for 30 years, and, and it wasn't until Lady Liberty that she finally picked one. I never gave up because that was like um, a, you know, a dream of mine. I achieved it a little bit with Lady Liberty, but I want to keep going. I want to keep working with her. So that's inspiring. So, you know, I think to what you were saying is like, how do I, how do I keep it all going? Like I said, um, you know, we live in Nashville, so it's not like I'm distracted by all these other things. I mean, we, ha we keep an apartment in New York, and we love going there to see theater and everything, but when it's time to go, it's time to go, and it's time to come back home. And then it's like, it's a life. It's a way of life. You know, the other night we had Bob Ezrin here and um, Cheryl and Alice Cooper and uh, we're talking, and it was so wonderful to hear Bob Ezra's stories and, and Alice's stories. And, and you're sitting there, it's like, I'm sitting here with them? Wow, what a blessed, perfect life I have. I suppose more Bon Jovi. I don't know chronologically which, which songs you wrote first, whether you were doing Bad Medicine and Born to Be My Baby or I Hate Myself for Loving You. I don't know which you know, which all they're written in, but they obviously both came out that, uh, that year in 1988. What was the experience with, uh, with Joan Jett? Well, I got a call from Kenny Laguna, her longtime, you know, business partner and, and manager and mentor and brother. And just, you know, she lived with, with, with Kenny and his wife for many years, you know, on Long Island. Like he's, she's like a daughter to, to Kenny. And Kenny is like, He's half Jewish and half Italian. So he knew how to work the music business. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. He, he had contacts, you know, in all areas. And um, he's the most wonderful man. And he worked so hard and so de devoted to her. And I just, um, I just got a call from him and he said, I want you to come right with Joni. We like the stuff you're doing, you know, with Aerosmith and Bon Jovi. So I got there and I, again, you know, I had a title in my back pocket. Um, I hate myself for loving you. Because uh, one of my mentors is Bob, was Bob Crew, who wrote all the songs for the Four Seasons. He wrote Lady Marmalade, you know. And he always taught me to come up with a title that has irony. So I hate myself for loving you. And at first... When I said the title, she says, no, I, I, I can't sing the word love anymore. I mean, I did, I love rock and roll. I don't want to sing the word love. I said, no, come on, give it a chance because it has the word hate in it. It balances it out. Anyway, she put up with it and we <laughs> wrote it and, you know, uh, I produced it and it, it's become a classic and even to this day, and the, that's the great thing about interpolations, it was interpolated into uh, the Sunday night uh, NFL football theme. And it was sung originally by Faith Hill, then Pink, then Carrie Underwood. And then she didn't want, she wanted to sing her own song. So they got away from that for a few years and they sang her song. And then by public demand, um, I Hate Myself for Loving You came back right. as a theme. And they did this great commercial with Joan is playing guitar on it. And, Incredible. uh, you know, so you know, even if it's not the, I mean, it has some of the original lyrics. I think the second verse goes, Hey Jack, it's a fact they're talking in town, you know, that stayed in, 
but when you it doesn't take anything away from the original song to hear that melody interpolated even though it has different lyrics so you know that's writing with her was what wonderful because she has such integrity i mean so pure in what she does people don't understand what an artist she is i mean i mean people do but her own fans do but people don't understand that you know she will not compromise i mean i don't know if she's ever done a product endorsement she's never done an amp strings drumsticks or anything like that she never has you know kind of from where she lives it's that would just not be right and so that's why i love working with her and also she's so beautiful that i was just so in love with her like just looking at her i think i was in love with the boy in her you know because <laughs> <laughs> she has a face like elvis and she's so meticulous and she's a virgo so when she writes out her lyrics she starts writing handwriting them and if she makes one mistake it's ripped up thrown away she starts over again until that lyric is perfectly written with no mistakes you know from her image you would not think she'd be that fussy but she is she's so like put together and beautiful and ah i'm just so in love with her i think this is becoming almost a theme as well um Joan Jett obviously had had a lot of success in America. Um, but that song was the song that kind of re reintroduced her to the rest of the world. And I, I think, you know, something you've done for so many of these artists is you you take them from like, obviously America's a massive market. I, I can't remember what the, the numbers are, but it's something like 40% of all music that's bought and sold is done in, in America. So obviously you can be famous in America and be incredibly wealthy. But so many artists you've worked with, you've 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 written songs with them that have made them into international superstars. And again, that's one of those songs. I I I I just it was everywhere in the UK. I think that songs have a life of their own. You know, they they become you know they're alive, and they're alive with with our energy, with our hopes and dreams. And then it's it's they're like vessels where everyone can put their hopes and dreams into it and then it keeps floating down the river or across the sea i mean that sounds kind of poetic to say but you know some songs have what they call legs and some songs don't and uh i've been lucky to have a look it's not like everything i touch is gold i mean i've written almost 5000 songs in my lifetime of those 5,000 songs, maybe 1,500 have been recorded. Of those 1,500, 80 have been top 40 hits. Of those 80 top 40 hits, maybe 20 have been in the top 20. Of those that reached number one, maybe it's 10. So it took 5,000 songs to write 10 good ones. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> those outlier hours, you can mark them in songs. And sometimes, you know, when young people come to me and I say, so tell me, how many songs have you written? Well, I have like three finished, and I started like like twenty others, uh, but I don't have the. I never finished those, and and I said, and that's like, really? And you want to be a uh, you know rock and roll star, man, or girl, or woman, or or they, them. <laughs> You can work so much harder than you think. You have to write a ton of really bad songs to start getting the gist of what it takes to deliver on so many levels. And so, you know, I try to inspire the interns and the people that I teach in master classes and stuff like that to like go crazy and write a song a day, write a hundred songs and then come back to me and let's see what you got because it really it's a skill and you really have to do it i mean you know of course there are geniuses like laura nero she wrote songs that were more like diaries of her love life when she was 14 15 years old that became some of the biggest songs of all time like you know and when i die wedding bell blues you know those she was like writing those songs because she was a born genius so you know, I think I'm, you know, maybe not a born genius, 
but I really worked hard to try to to come up to that higher higher level. I was inspired because I was born poor and we lived in the projects of Liberty City. My mom worked at Burger King. Our dinner would be at 11.30 at night when she'd come home after cleaning the kitchen. Like these old soggy burgers where we couldn't eat the bottom uh, bread so we'd take the top off of another one to make a bottom to eat. You know, and um, she was a songwriter too, and she really struggled. And you know, she her English wasn't that good. She was poor, but she was very beautiful, and she did get cuts. But she was working really hard. So even on weekends, she was out with her songs at nightclubs, trying to get people to to you know, she'd go up, up to an artist and give her tape. Wow, yeah, you know. She so she was she was like the Diane Warren before there was a Diane Warren. They actually looked a, a little bit alike, you know. The, Diane always reminds me of her, and that's why I think Diane touches my heart so much. Um, but that same kind of energy, you know, like you know, it's like, you know, let's <laughs> let's do this, let's let's make something happen. And I admire Diane so much. I mean, she's had twelve Academy Award nominations. Incredible. I mean, I'd be so happy just to get one, you know, <laughs> because then I can add it to my, uh, you know, one time Academy Award nominee. I would love that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but she doesn't give up. She doesn't give up. She doesn't give up. People should learn from that, you know, and she's, you know, I just adore her. And I'm so inspired by her, her work ethic. I think... The Carol King said, I, I probably can't remember the exact number, but I want to say she said she wrote 300 songs before she wrote one good one. Not well, even a hit, just a good one. <laughs> I think, I think uh, you know, that was quick. <laughs> to get to a good one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was quick. Um, you know, I met Carol King at a writer's camp in France, Miles Copeland writer's camp. And I only went so I could, and I only agreed to go if I could have a day with Carol Kay. Oh, beautiful. And so we wrote a song together and I was so in seventh heaven. And then she came to Miami uh, to demo the song. And uh, we spent a few days, you know, when we lived there right on the water, we had these beautiful dinners out on the outside, you know, in the little kind of canopy. And then I went to see her in a play, Brighton Beach Memoirs in, in Ireland. And uh, yes, I went, I went there to Dublin to, to see her acting. And she's just so multi-talented, you know, and I just adore her so much. And I would love to work with her again. Could you put in a good word for me? <laughs> <laughs> No, it's about, did that song ever come out that you that you wrote together? No, no, we didn't. It didn't really. You know, it was a fun, beautiful song, and maybe I should pull it out, dust it off, and you know, get a, get you know a new spin on it because it was a great song. We're only at uh, nineteen eighty eight, <laughs> but we did talk about poison earlier. But again, you see, just to reiterate what I've now said two or three times over, poison's another one of those songs. I remember being a kid in England and knowing of Schools Out, for instance, and knowing who Alice Cooper was, you know, because of Schools Out would be in movies and stuff like that. But Poison was a song that was a massive international smash. And that allowed me to go back and discover the back catalogue of Alice Cooper. How did you end up working with Alice? My publisher at the time, Deirdre O'Hara at EMI, she was married to Bob Pfeiffer. He was an A&R guy at Epic Records. She suggested that I work with him. Before I knew it, we had made trash. That's how it happened. And, you know, like I said, he was here for dinner two nights ago. It's pretty cool to have, you know, Alice Cooper at your house on Halloween, right? Did he come in full makeup? I mean... <laughs> he didn't have to. <laughs> I actually wore the makeup. I wore the makeup to the dinner. And the, the, like, he was so like, he had such a kick out of it. I, I come to dinner in a red, uh, in a big red velvet shirt 
you know, and I put the Alice Cooper makeup on and everything. And he was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I think he got a good kick out of it. I absolutely love How Can We Be Lovers. That is such a beautiful, beautiful song. Can you give us a little bit of uh, backstory on that one? Diane Warren and I got together with Michael Bolton and we co-wrote How Can We Be Lovers If We Can't Be Friends. And then I ended up uh, producing it. Beautiful. Um, and, uh, but I have a funny story because we Please. were producing it. And, you know, Michael at that time, you know, he's kind of a very serious guy. He's never, he has a great laugh and a great sense of humor. But when it comes to work, he's all work and very serious. And so we were, we were in the studio and I was putting on the final touches of these drum crashes on How Can We Be Lovers? And we were going into the modulation and as Bobby Chenard, and he was there, and I was facing my engineer, I was standing behind the board, the, the drummer was on the other side of the glass behind me, and we go to do the overdub, and all of a sudden, right on the downbeat, almost all the instruments stopped except for a few that kept going. And I said, what's going on? And all of a sudden, Arthur like stops the thing. He had, he had ordered a remote, and the, the assistant engineer came under the desk and plugged in the remote, but 18 of the tracks were in record. So when we go into the modulation, silent, I mean, it's like, wow. <laughs> oh, no. And then all of a sudden, I had to do some really quick thinking because at that time, you know, I think Michael had, would, would have preferred me using his engineer who he's comfortable with. But I insisted on Sir Arthur Payson, who's my engineer. And so he was very suspicious of Arthur. And so all of a sudden, this is happening. And we hear, oh, Michael's on his way up. I think we were, you know, the record planner. Michael's on his way up. And I said, open the board, open the board. And then get the assistant in there with, you know, into the board, like, like a hood up, like in a car that broke down. And, and Michael and Arthur's like pale white, you know, like it's just like he turned green, like with fear. And Michael comes in and goes, Hey, you guys, what's going on? What, what's wrong with the board? It's just, you know, we, we have to do this little fix, you know, just, um, just wait in the lounge and, you know, we'll be rolling very soon. Meanwhile, like so many tracks were gone and it's not like I could, it wasn't like Pro Tool time where you could fly. It was in the modulation. So we didn't have that material anywhere else in the, in the song. Oh, so I put him in the lounge and he kept, he kept kind of, uh, and I kept going in there. Are you okay? Are you okay? What's going on? You know, it's like, I don't know. They said they're good. There's something wrong with the board. They're going to fix it. Well, why don't we move to another studio? I said, well, you know, we have all our tapes here and everything. Let's just give them a chance to fix it. That was like at like 11 in the morning. Now it's five o'clock in the afternoon. Oh. <laughs> and I'm still making excuses. And finally said, oh, I'm out of here. You know, and he got, got in his limo, went back to, uh, to Connecticut. That's when we started this whole process. I had already tried to book all the musicians to come back to re-record the ending of the song, <laughs> including the string players. It cost to, to re that repair cost like $20,000. Oh, and we worked all night. And then when Michael came in the next day, we were like the staff on Downton Abbey. We were like standing there. It's like, hello, Michael, Are you ready to sing? <laughs> and we never told him. Does he and know so now or is he finding he out now? Did. Well, he showed up. <laughs> A couple of years ago, he showed up at Valerie Simpson's uh, soul. It's called uh, the Sugar Bar. It's a soul club, a Motown that she started with uh, Nick Ashford and Valerie Simpson. It's you know. So he showed up there with a kind of like a a film crew. They were kind of following him around, and I and I said, "Oh, Valerie, let me introduce him." And so I went up there and I said, "Okay." Before I start, I have a confession to make. And I told the whole story. Wow. Like this is 30 years later. And he fell, he fell on the floor laughing. 
<laughs> he wouldn't have been laughing then. No. I can assure you of that. And that Arthur would have been like so like thrown out. Yep. So I I I never lie, but that's one of the times that I I I had to lie to save to save Arthur. You know. <laughs> <laughs> So that was like my adventure with How Can We Be Lovers. However it came about, it ended up becoming a massive hit and just such an incredible song. Did you already have a title in mind before he came in? Did, was it part of a conversation between the you know, three of you? I, I can't remember who came up with the title. Three strong lyricists in the room. I don't remember how sure. that came about. If I had come up with it, I probably would say I came up with it. But I honestly cannot remember who came up with it. You know, maybe it was Michael, you know, how can we be lovers? How can we be lovers if we can't be friends? I mean, it has that kind of opposite thing that, you know, I try to put in all my titles, but they also have that skill too. So I think it was Michael who came up with it, but it just was one of those things. Once you had the, the, the title, the song wrote itself. It really did. It was so fast. It's another proof of the pudding. You know, it, it's, it, it was, uh, Top 10 hit in in the UK at a time it didn't, you know, where that that artist and that song should not have fit the m current music scene at the time. But it's such a good song that, boom, top 10 hit. I mean, yeah. Well, he, he can't do a show without it. Oh, God, no. <laughs> Before we go, yes, I, I, w I would like to uh, tell people about my upcoming autobiography. Please. Called it's called Living on a Prayer, Big Songs, Big Life with David Ritz, who also wrote Joe Perry's um, autobiography with Joe, uh, co-wrote. And um, I'm so excited about it. It's taken five years wow. to do. And we're, at, we're still at the, today I was rewriting certain sections, you know, because it depends on how I feel about the people I'm writing with at that day. You know, it's like, <laughs> no, I really do like them. Wait, I, I was too hard on him. You know, it's like, you know what? Screw him. I'm going to, you know, <laughs> make it even worse. You know? <laughs> but uh, I, I, it's, a, it's a wonderful journey. It's very cinematic. It tells us, it's really a lot about the story of me and my mother, you know, and um, how, you know, our relationship, and she was a songwriter, and how basically... I fulfilled her long, you know, lifelong dream, you know. When I got um, inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame, she was alive then and she came to the show and I, you know, kind of made a tribute to her from the stage and she stood up and then, uh, Beautiful. you know, she, she got this like huge uh, standing, like not standing ovation, but this huge roar of the crowd. And then she turned around and it was like, wow you know then the crowd went crazy so it was like she was getting the award <laughs> oh it's beautiful and so so you know that's that and the book is full of great stories like that and um i'll be doing my concerts and we're working on my documentary bit by bit so i have a lot of things to do and uh you know i'm writing songs now so it's like I'm reaching into the past, making sure that it's preserved and that people remember, you know, me and, and the songs that I wrote. And also, you know, looking at the future as well and wanting to write with young people. And I'm, I'm, I just got the news that I'm going to be writing with Jake Wesley Rogers, uh, I think, uh, in a few weeks. And I'm so excited. So I really recommend everyone tuning into Jake Wesley Rogers. He has just inspired me so much. He has a song, Pluto. It's like David Bowie meets Elton John meets Freddie Mercury, all rolled into one. And he's Incredible. only 20, he's only 23 years old. And he played a he played a little club. And it's the first show I've seen in two years the other night at the basement east here in Nashville. I was like, it took my breath away seeing that greatness like that I hadn't seen in so long. So I really recommend him. And um, I want to say that I appreciate your time with me and, and for oh, thinking of me. Thank you. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your, your talent. Um, 
I, I, I've been such a huge fan of yours since the first time I ever heard a song that you you wrote. And uh, I, I don't see enough interviews and stuff with you. And I was just like, maybe I'll never be able to interview him. Maybe he doesn't do interviews. And, and so thank you to Louise, obviously, for connecting us. Um, yes. Thank you, Desmond. And uh, have a marvelous day. And I'm excited to, to read your autobiography, see your documentary and everything else. Thank you. Okay. And hear more of your incredible songs. Thank you.